And yeah, welcome everyone. And welcome to Coastal Insights, our online live and interactive learning series. Um, I'm super excited for today's episode. So my name is Maureen Bo, and I'm your host for today. And I'm joining you live from the traditional territory of the Kowakiwak First Nations here on the very northern tip of Vancouver Island. It's a beautiful place I now call home. And yeah, we are in episode six of our online learning series. So I can't believe it's been six weeks already since we started. And it's been such a blast to be able to learn alongside everybody throughout this whole learning series. And so we've been very fortunate to have some amazing guests join us each week who are sharing their work, their research, um, and the many ways that they are helping to protect our beautiful coastline in beautiful British Columbia. And so hopefully these episodes and series are inspiring people to learn more about the coast and improve our understanding and also gain new perspective on where we live. So I'm very excited for today's episode. Um, before we begin, I just want to get a sense of where everyone's coming from. And so we've been so fortunate to have this platform because we are reaching people from all over and people from all ages. So if you see the little chat box, I just wanna get a sense of where people are coming from. We definitely have lots of um, returning attendees. I see people from Langley or Langford, Port McNeil, you clue it. Uh, let us know too if this is your first time or if this is your sixth time. We definitely have some diehards. So very, uh, very happy to see that. Mark six time, awesome, from Brazil. So I think that is definitely <laughs> the farthest uh, that we have. But yeah, without further ado, I'm just gonna share a couple reminders with people. So we, we can't hear or see you, but we do have that chat box that you can write comments on, or if there's any technical difficulties, just let us know. Um, throughout the presentation, if you have a question that comes up, please put it into the Q&A box that's located at the bottom of your screen. And we'll open up the floor to everyone to interact with our guest speaker at the end. So you can feel free to save your questions or write it in the Q&A box if you don't wanna forget. Um, and so yeah, so you can't see or hear each other, uh, but these episodes are all recorded. And at the end of the, the episode, we upload them to our website, which I'll share with you at the end. So if you missed it, you want to watch them again um, they'll be available later online so please feel free as well to share with anybody that you think might be interested uh, and now I just want to get a sense as well um, how like what type of guests are joining are you interested adults are you students we've had young and old join us and so we're super thankful for that all right so today's episode we're going to be chatting more about salmon. So pretty much throughout all of our episodes, there has been mentioned in some way, shape or form, salmon. And that is because salmon is the foundation species of British Columbia. And so it will come up again and again, probably through the rest of our, our uh, pre presentations as well. But because it's such an important topic, we dedicated last week's episode and this week's episode specifically to salmon. And so last week, we got a little sense of understanding the threats of salmon in BC and what Wayne Coast is actually doing to do some research and restoration work in the Fraser River estuary. So today, um, we're gonna be taking a visual journey through urban Vancouver and greater Vancouver to find out about some of the wild salmon that live literally right in our backyards. So just to set the scene, I'm just gonna share with you first a quick little image so I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see this. So I'm sharing with you an image of Vancouver. So those of you who are visiting from afar um, or might not be familiar, this is the city of Vancouver. And so there's English Bay, there's Stanley Park, and all these blue lines are old streams that existed in Vancouver and uh, where it once was. And so now we know Vancouver as this booming metropolis with lots of high rises and condos and streets. Um, but there were lots of streams that once existed in this area. And so I'm gonna show you my next image. And this is 
the lower Fraser Valley. And so all the blue here are the streams and rivers and water systems. Um, so you see Vancouver, Richmond Delta down there, and all the red are the lost streams. So these are streams that have been impacted or developed on um, through urban development. And so although many of the streams have been impacted by development, there are still streams that exist with wild salmon in them. And so today, our guests will be sharing some of these images from the wild salmon right in our backyard. So without further ado, I'm introducing you to our feature presenter, who is a professional nature photographer from based in North Vancouver. He's not from Vancouver, but based in North Vancouver. Um, he's earned recognition for his ecology and conservation photography and video um, of the beautiful wildlife and nature of BC and beyond. And so he's here to share his story about how he got inspired and what he's doing to inspire others about protecting wild salmon. So I introduce to you Fernando <coughs> Lefa. Hello everyone. Uh, thanks so much for having me and uh, just share my screen here. There you go. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge uh, that this project was done on the First Squamish and uh, Muskan First Nation territory. And uh, a lot of my work is, is done in collaboration with First Na Nations and I'm very thankful to have them preserved as special places. So uh, the Urban Salmon Project um, is the first uh, uh, documentation of the Salmon in Vancouver. And uh, everything started with this uh, iconic picture. Uh, most people familiar with uh, BC and uh, Vancouver notice uh, this, the signs uh, up close to the streets. And for most people, that's the only way they know there ever existed uh, salmon around. They just see it and they already know uh, what exactly that means. But some people take it a bit further and they walk a few times by the streams and they see something that's uh, close to what uh, I'm going to show in this short clip. Uh oh. Uh, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's working now. Perfect. Sorry, guys. I'll, I'll, I'll start all over again. Um, sorry here. So uh, the Urban Salmon Project is the first uh, documentation of the salmon in, in uh, Metro Vancouver. And uh, it all started with this uh, iconic uh, image. I think most people uh, from uh, Vancouver or, or from BC are familiar with the signs that you can find uh, close to the uh, urban streams or streams that you can uh, find salmon. <clears throat> and for most people, that's the only reference they have. They don't really know exactly what that means. But uh, some other people take it a, a bit further and uh, they really walk by the creeks and they see something that uh, I'm going to show in this uh, short clip. And uh, it's very hard for sometimes to imagine what happens underwater. And that's exactly what I want to show people. And we're talking this is more like the reality. Uh, the Salmon Run is one of the most spectacular displays of natural beauty in the world. And uh, it happens so close to us uh, just by our backyard. 
So uh, that's Capilano River in North Vancouver, and these are all adult coho salmon. And that totally got me hooked because it, it's so amazing and it's so close to us. But uh, there's not uh, enough uh, information available. Uh, I had a really hard time figuring out where fish can be found, when it comes, and which are the actually active salmon streams, and so not enough uh, information available. Uh, that's the first uh, salmon I've ever photographed uh, in the Metro in Vancouver. That's Burney Creek, which is probably the, one of the smallest uh, salmon streams that we get in a greater Vancouver. It's probably, it has less than 300 meter uh, of salmon uh, habitat. And I, had, I was so lucky to uh, photograph this big mayo chum uh, almost out of the water. So that's just uh, amazing. Uh, so, the urban salmon is the first uh, photograph documentation and documenting all the salmonids, so not just salmon. And everything starts uh, in 2016 in September. Uh, I had after watching that scene and seems like this you know so many fish together you can see here are all coho salmon there's one uh, chinook here on the uh, bottom right it's, it's so amazing so i decided uh to keep exploring the the watershed all year long so uh even in the winter that's a very important time for salmon because that's where you get the uh, endangered steelhead that's a red listed uh fish uh, endangered and in, uh, threatened in most watershed that it can be found. Uh, this was taken in Link Creek, uh, North Vancouver. That's my home creek. That's less than a, that's three minutes walk from my place. And unfortunately, I haven't seen this fish coming back in the last three years. So hope they, they made it. And in four years, uh, I visit uh, 30 creeks and rivers in Northwest Vancouver, Vancouver, Burnaby, Langley, Coquitlam, Surrey, and recently uh, Richmond, not in creeks, but in the estuaries and the Fraser. <coughs> and the project is about registering uh, images like this. These are uh, adult coho, that's in Capilano River. That's very close to the hatchery, which is a touristic place very uh, popular for fishermen as well. And that's around eight meter deep. And these are all adult fish around three, four kilos each. So it, it, that's just beautiful. And like this, these are coho. You can see it, it's transitioning from like the, the silver color it has in the ocean to the red color, the red spawning color when in, it, it's in the spawning season. <clears throat> Uh, but people ask me, where does it come from? How this uh, crazy salmon started and how I got into this uh, work. So I grew up uh, fishing and uh, outdoors. Uh, I'm, I've been fishing, uh, fly fishing my whole life. So I've always been uh, connected to fresh water, especially. And I, am, I was born in a, a small town in, in Brazil. It's called Piracicaba. And Piracicaba in the Tupi First Nation language means a uh, spot where the fish stops or holds. So we have a big waterfall um, that big, uh, small fish can't uh, climb. So they tend to concentrate by this uh, rapids. So big fish will come uh, to feed on them. So the city and the river became famous for the number and the size of fish. So I grew up listening to the stories about this amazing fishing in the river. So these are images from the 50s and 60s. You can see the size of the catfish and the abundance of, uh, of fish. And I was very lucky to meet this uh, young kid here on the, on the right in the red circle. Uh, he ended up becoming one of the most um, important freshwater sailors uh, exploring uh, most of the most important Brazilian rivers in the 70s and 80s. Uh, I was uh, very lucky to meet him. And, but when was my time to go fishing? The, the fishing were uh, all gone. Um, 
Uh, that's the uh, Salmonus brasiliensis. That's uh, one of the most iconic fish we have in our uh, watershed and the population uh, it's almost extinct. Uh, it took me a few years to be able to uh, fly fish one and that was the last time I uh, saw it. But, and people were not able to say when the fish disappeared. Uh, there was just no story. They just say, well, you know, in, I don't know where is fish. And they don't know what happened when that happens. And that was very frustrating. So I decided that I would learn how to tell a story so that would not happen again. Because uh, uh, I figure out if I want people to care, I need to take them to places and habitats I care about. But sometimes I can't take people physically, so I have to take their eyes and their heart. And uh, I had the chance to visit some uh, unique places. So this is the entrance of the Apiaca First Nation land. That's uh, probably one of the very few remaining uh, uncontact uh, First Nation groups in Brazil. And these people actively avoid contact with white uh, people in the last 200 years. And this is a sacred place for them. And unfortunately, this is threatened. And there's a big chance that this amazing waterfall will be turning into a 90 kilometer diameter uh, lake in the middle of the Amazon forest. Uh, that's an aerial view of the area. So no roads, no city, nothing around it for 200 kilometers. So it's just an untouched place. Uh, and then also documenting the Atlantic rainforest, which is very similar uh, in, in terms of uh, structure of the, 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 rain, the temperate rainforest we get here. So documenting the fish fauna and some very cool uh, animals like this one here. You can see it's, it's totally camouflaged in the, in the bottom. And you can see on the right, the river kind of remembers the, the salmon creeks we see it here and in North America. Uh, some more images and some really cool fish. So uh, freshwater prawns and uh, this is an electric eel. It, uh, it uh, communicates with other uh, fishes of the same species. It, it's really cool, this fish. Very unique uh, fauna there. Uh, back in, uh, to BC, uh, I had the chance to explore the Fraser Valley, um, diving with the white sturgeon in the Harrison and Fraser River. Uh, this guy here is around um, nine feet, so close to uh, three meter long, and it's just a juvenile. Uh, this fish can uh, live uh, more than 100 years, so God knows how si the size it can reach. Uh, documenting the Chinook Run, this was last year, also in the Fraser Valley. And more recently, the Fraser River Delta, which is a key area for, uh, for salmon. So these are very recent from uh, last week. So now we get in the super low tides, it's a beautiful spot. And uh, people ask, how do I do it? Uh, if I get in the water, if I use GoPros, or what kind of you know, gear I use? So this is uh, me in Link Creek, it's very cold water. And uh, here on the right is my car, that's how I carry my gear, that's in the Adam uh, Sockeye Run in 2018. Uh, sometimes it's super shallow, so it can get in the water, uh, there's just not enough room, so I have to, to find a way. And here on the right you can see uh, what I'm doing, and on the right you see the results, so uh, especially cold, they can get you very shallow places and you know, almost like a monkey. And the short video. So yeah, just uh, some behind the scenes and just uh, some attention on this uh, last image here. Uh, I'm not using fins and I'm kind of uh, just using the wetsuit. So I f float 
uh, in order not to step on the gravel where there's a salmon eggs, these are spawning time. So you have to be extremely careful not to stress fish, not step on the eggs. So just a, a note about that. And the project also documented some other rare fish. It's not just about salmonids. Uh, this is the Nooksack bass. Uh, there's estimate there's less than 10,000 of this fish uh, in total. In only in six different rivers, not uh, just in uh, Greater Vancouver, but uh, some in North Washington. But less than 10,000, that's very, very few. So it's super, uh, it's, it's an endangered species. And uh, that's the Dolly Varden. Uh, that's not a salmon. They're they kind of close and they share habitats. Uh, they're uh, threatened in many watersheds, and we're very lucky uh, just to find it in a few creeks here in, in Greater Vancouver. Not a very easy fish to find. And freshwater sponges. which many people don't get to see. They're uh, cousins of the ones you find in the ocean and they have this bright green or sometimes white, yellow color. They're amazing, amazing uh, creatures. Uh, and some other macro beauty, uh, especially in fresh water, it's very rare that uh, animals can afford energy into getting uh, colorful, you know, like color and, you know, the stuff you would get in, in the reefs. So this uh, small snail, you get all this glitter here. It uh, was uh, very special and you don't see the kind of um, beauty all the time. And I'm also documenting the education and how work of a lot of uh, researchers and technicians, you know, working in a watershed and dealing with such a fragile creatures. And uh, salmon, it's, a, it's an amazing fish. It goes from fresh water to the ocean and back, and you can find it in such a variety of environments. Uh, sometimes close to the ocean, you even uh, get to find some jellyfish uh, in the environment. So uh, very cool animals. Um, some caddisfly, these are a very important source of food for salmon and all the other salmonids. And uh, they have this cool uh, house that they carry around. It's, uh, they build it with small rocks and they, uh, they're an important indicator of the quality of water. Uh, there's a, a short clip of it. And they are one or two centimeters long. They're very small creatures. Um, these are uh, dragonfly. Uh, before it emerges and, and turn into the, the dragonflies we we, uh, we use, and they're big uh, predators in the ecosystem, uh, feeding on small even some species feeding on small fish. And recently uh, starting documenting the fauna, they rely on salmon that is associated with the salmon. So uh, this uh, author uh, that's recent, uh, that's last week, uh, uh, that's camera trap. And I was lucky to have this family resting in front of my camera for 40 minutes. Um, bears, of course, they're a very important part of the ecosystem, especially dragging uh, the salmon from the river uh, to the forest. So uh, they're key uh, speech. Um, it's a nice uh, image. So uh, different uh, salmon is here. You can have a uh, cutthroat trout. You have juvenile coho. Uh, you have a rainbow trout. That's in North Vancouver in a very small creek called Time Creek. And deer, uh, it, it does not feed on salmon, but it feeds on the vegetation. The benefits from the from the uh, the dead salmon that the animals bring. So they're part of, important part of the ecosystem. Uh, here's a back in salmon, a female pink salmon. Uh, that's in a Seymour uh, uh, River in, in North Vancouver, close to Maplewood Farm. Beautiful place to go and, and see fish when salmon is running. 
And that's the same fish that's a male. You can see it has this big hump. Uh, some people call them humpy. And you, you can see transitioning uh, from uh, the silver color to this, a spawning color. In the top left here, you can see a more silvery uh, animal. Uh, these are coho. That's one of my favorite salmon. Uh, that's in Langley and uh, a close to Thai head hatchery. And uh, it's just beautiful to see. And uh, you see the, this one more red is uh, in full spawning color. And the ones on the left, you can see they transitioning from the silver ocean color to the reddish. Beautiful place. And uh, this is a huge Chinook salmon. Chinook are not native originally from the uh, North Vancouver watershed, but uh, you, you can find a, a few returning every year. And this is uh, over 40 or more than 20 kilo uh, fish. It's just massive. And uh, the project also document the whole salmon, uh, salmon cycle. So it's just not the adults, it's from juvenile, from eggs, hatch, and, and the whole cycle. So these are uh, salmon eggs in a seam or river. And uh, as a short clip. So not sure if it's everyone uh, is familiar with the, with the salmon. So uh, the eggs, they're laid in fresh water. Then this, the adult migrate to the ocean when they spend some time and then return to fresh water again when they lay their eggs and then they will all die. And that's very important because the dead salmon will fertilize the rivers. So when the eggs hatch, they will have enough organic matter to feed and insects in the water. So basically, the, the dead generation will uh, uh, fertilize for the, for the upcoming generation. So that's why you see him, uh, the one dying and the small egg. And uh, <clears throat> this, is a, this is a picture of, the, of a salmon egg. This is a coho embryo. It's around uh, 15 days. And uh, it's really cool to see the live one because you have the, the shell and the embryo moves inside this kind of this kind of small globe and uh, this small uh, circles you can see on the left these are fat that will feed that the embryo will feed until it can uh, hatches so and the red thing the black things here are the eyes and you can even see some of the 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 spine here on the, the top left is that not our figure? When the eggs hatch, they're turning into this beautiful small salmons, and especially in the spring, uh, it's very easy to see them. And uh, why do I do it? Uh, why I'm so passionate about it? So uh, science is an important foundation, but unfortunately, it does not create emotional connections. And uh, that's a quote from Paul Nicklin. When I'm underwater, I'm the only chance in connecting the world with this underwater reality. And that's throughout the visions I come back with. So I, I have this feeling of showing people these amazing places I see. And I think that's the way. Because conservation photography, throughout storytelling, we can capture the heart. We can really show people, you know, it, it's not about numbers. It's how amazing what that, those numbers mean, right? We can kind of show the beauty of that. And once you can capture the heart, mind will follow. So photography, every 
human being likes beautiful pictures. It's always a, a way to start a conversation, to create a connection with someone. Uh, and just saw some more image. That's a, a chum in Stony Creek. That's one of the most important uh, salmon streams. The water runs straight from Burnaby Mountains. Uh, not a lot of development around, so you can still get uh, some, some salmon returning every year and even, st even still had. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, after spawning, the salmon uh, will die. And that's the beauty of the cycle, death. It's, it's involved in life. And uh, that's in the Capilano River. Uh, it's important that to say that they're not native from the watershed, but they were introduced some years ago. And the salmon population in the greater Vancouver is a mix, uh, mostly wild, but we still get some hatchery. And uh, Capilano River is an important uh, fishing spot and it's good so people can enjoy it close to the city. They don't need to go on, on more uh, pristine places to enjoy their sport. Uh, and it's a beautiful picture. Sometimes you have the chance to get very close to uh, to fish. When fish get used to you, they don't really they don't really care. They let you get very close. So these are all chum, and it's really nice to watch how they stay in the bottom of the river, how they position in order not to waste energy and just hold against the water and get more oxygen flowing. And the urban salmon goal is educate people about the existence of salmon living in their backyard and its importance. Just tell people this amazing uh, uh, natural beauty thing is just happening in their backyard. It's just so close to them. Basically just go around the block and there's a big chance you may find uh, salmon in your uh, backyard. And it's so important to have it there. Uh, and we work in that throughout uh, publishing a book. Uh, you can find it on Amazon and uh, uh, bookstores uh, around Vancouver. And we also create an image bank to be used by stream keepers and uh, schools. So they can use for their education projects, their uh, events. <clears throat> and we also organized a uh, two underwater cleanup, uh, taking over 300 kilos of garbage and ghost fish and tackle from the river. That's a big hazard, not just from fish, but from us, people that go there for a swim. They're, unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, ghost fish and tackle. So we tried uh, to make that, to improve that a little bit. That's a short. <laughs> can see uh, cleaning uh, ghost fishing tackle is a super specialized work and uh, very thankful to have uh, uh, divers for cleaning uh, cleaner rivers and ocean. It's an organization that, that do underwater cleanups and they're helping us in this. I'm very thankful for the work. And also that generated some early media bringing the chance for uh, public presentations. And now the goal is turn the project into a documentary this year. Hopefully can achieve that too. And we also plan our urban salmon walks for fall 2020. Uh, it seems that we will be able to do it. So, and thank you so much. The project has a website, urbansalmon.com. Uh, you can also find uh, uh, about my work at fernandolessa.ca. And uh, I keep an Instagram, the urban salmon project. So. If you like salmon, that's a really good source of information. Uh, I post there uh, almost every day, so you can find about salmon uh, all year round. And uh, thank you. 
That was awesome. Well, thank you, Fernando. And thank you. I don't know if you had a, a challenge for, for people. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I have the challenge. So, uh, the challenge is name the salmonids that can be found in the greater Vancouver area. All right. Yeah. So uh, that was amazing. It was so mesmerizing to just watch this visual journey through all these different streams and creeks that are literally right in, in our backyards. And so a lot of people might not realize they're walking beside these amazing creatures and, and insects and slugs and freshwater sponges that we never <laughs> knew about. So it's, uh, it's really great to be able to go to these underwater areas where not a lot of people are able to visit. And so thank you. Thank you very much for, for the work you do and the photography. Yeah, it's just amazing. So a lot of people might be interested in photography. Um, so hopefully, yeah, if, if you're interested in photography, connect with Fernando. And if you are interested in learning more about wildlife photography, we will have an episode later on dedicated to wildlife photography um, and its, its role in conservation, because it is important to be able to connect people to these animals and these places through that. But thank you. It's, it was very thank you. Um, awesome. So we will open up the floor to questions now. I know there were a couple kind of uh, um, speckled throughout our chat. So hopefully I can try and, and find those again. But if you do have specific questions for Fernando or anything um, regarding this topic, please feel free to put it in the Q&A box. Um, I know one question I, I saw earlier was from the photo, the black and white photo. And it was asking what was the what type of catfish that was. Do you the know the specific type? Black and white one. Let me let me find out which one. Uh, black and white one. The the early image where it was from. I think from your home um, area. With oh wow. Oh, yes. Okay. The, yeah, that's in Link Creek. Those are uh, uh, Coho and there's one uh, Chinook in the in the bottom left. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is it the one in Brazil that yeah, you mean? Yeah, I think that's the one in Brazil. Also. Okay. Um, those, uh, let me get the name in English for uh, the name. They have a a name in English for it. It's a catfish. Um, I can't find it here. That give me. Sometimes I keep they keep those as a as a pet. Oh yeah. Yeah, they just grow humongous. <laughs> they oh, get like sure. 40, 50 kilos. Oh. So yeah, they call it a tiger uh, shovel nose catfish. Oh, tiger shovel nose catfish. Okay, awesome. And that's a native species to Brazil. Yes, they are, uh, they are native uh, from, an, um, they are native all, all over uh, South America, uh, Amazon uh, forest as well. Nice, awesome. Okay, so I have a question here in the chat box or Q&A box that says, why do salmon change color when they enter fresh water? <clears throat> so when they come back to spawn? Yeah, so um, the, uh, the adult, they spend their life in the ocean. So when they're getting close to the spawning time, they start coming back to, uh, to close to the river mouth and get adapted, uh, adapting their, back, their bodies back to fresh water and getting ready to spawn. So there's a lot of hormones uh, flowing and they stop feeding. So uh, turning color is part of their adaptation. Maybe they just look nicer for, for, their, <laughs> for their salmon. So uh, it, it's a part of... Uh, modification that happens in their body. So uh, some, some get red, some get their mouth crooked. So there's a, uh, many transformations then that happens and turning red is, is, is part of, of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love uh, when it's spawning season, just seeing all the salmon come back. It's pretty ama amazing their, their transformations and the color changes they go through and the, the teeth that they develop. And so some people ask too, like what, why, why do they have teeth? Do you, uh, do you want to answer it or do you? Uh, well, I don't know exactly why they have, but 
I've seen, especially the males, when they're fighting for uh, the best spawning round, they really kind of bite uh, the tails fighting for their territory. So I, I guess the, it's not they develop the teeth, basically their, their uh, mouths get crooked, so the teeth get more exposed and then they grow in size. So I think they use that to uh, kind of fight for, for females and, and fight for, for, for the territory. Mm -hmm. Because uh, like once they got in fresh water, they, not, they don't feed anymore. So maybe they have to find good use for, for the teeth. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely for defense and defending their, their nest sites. Um, and I've heard as well where they've, uh, people have witnessed some of these salmon that have to go up different, different waterfalls or different areas. And they've used their teeth to actually try and climb up different uh, little like, ladders yeah. or waterfalls <laughs> just to go up <laughs> vertically. So it's quite impressive. Huh. Um, yeah, yeah it's quite an amazing species. <laughs> it is very amazing. Um, another question is how far do they travel when they go into the sea? Uh, well, I'm, I'm not a salmon, uh, salmon scientist, but um, I'm sure they go uh, close to Russia. They go all the way to the North uh, Pacific. And they not just stay close to the coast, they really migrate to the open ocean. Um, so uh, they they move thousands and thousands of kilometers during the, their, uh, their life. And then they come back to the same river where they were born uh, to respond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite an impressive journey they take. And so who knows where they go out in the open ocean, they go explore. <laughs> right. <laughs> life and then always come back to the same stream. And so do yeah. you know um, what, what, how they indicate the exact same stream that they came from? Well, uh, I, I think so far uh, it's believed that there are some hormones that they can trace um, in the water that they were born. So they come back, they can uh, come back to exactly the same water. Um, something uh, really interesting that happens here, and especially I noticed that in, in the North Shore, maybe because I'm more in the water here, um, sometimes the salmon, they, they get to the wrong creek. So, for example, uh, you'd see right now uh, in Lynn Creek, you get a very, very early uh, salmon run, but those are uh, salmon that are actually going to the Capilano. So you go now, there's salmon in the river, and you go back a week later and say, uh-oh, oh, wrong river. So they, they go back to the, the Capilano, and there's less salmon in Lynn Creek. For, so they really find, they really look for exactly where they were born. So it, it's, it's just amazing to see and they climb waterfalls, there's no obstacle. They can jump, they, can, they do, they will find a way. Yeah, definitely. They're determined to get back there. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I've, I've learned as well through just my salmon studies that if they lay maybe like 2,000 eggs or so, um, only maybe one or two might come back to spawn again of those eggs. And so that's why they, they lay lots of eggs, but there's so many obstacles throughout their whole life that impede on, um, on them coming back. And so it's impressive if they're able to come back and spawn again and restart that life cycle. But yeah, oh. let's see. Um, there's a question from the Q&A, maybe it's a comment as well. Did you say the Chinook salmon aren't native? And, and then that's the main fish that the orca rely on. Yes. Um... In my conversation with the uh, uh, researchers and scientists, uh, there were uh, there was no um, how to say there were no numbers or records of uh, Chinook in the early times here in the North Vancouver, and apparently there was a program of trying to introduce uh, it in the 70s and 80s. And as far as I'm aware, the program were uh, discontinued. But there's a small population. Then they come every year. So um, I, I don't know how that works in the whole salmon ecosystem, but yeah, we do get some uh, Chinook and they are definitely the menu for, for the killer whales. So that's it. it we get in some fish there and they are by far the biggest salmon we get. And I, I show a picture, they go like over 20 kilos, just like really big fish. Huge, yeah, thank you for that. Um, 
So if you have any other questions, feel free to write it in. Um, I actually have a question or comment as well. Um, so because everybody is living so close, especially in our urban environment, so Metro Vancouver, Greater Vancouver, right, right alongside these, um, these salmon streams and creeks, what can you say about the connections of people at home, inside their homes, um, and how people are impacting or what they can do to protect some of these creeks? Oh yeah, that, that's very important, uh, especially because we have it in our backyard. So if you leave anything in your backyard and the big rain comes, then they will end up in the river. So that's something that I think we have to, to be aware of. And especially uh, you can find, uh, I know in Vancouver and some other municipalities, you can find those signs by the rain drains. It's a yellow fish painted by the road. That means that there was at some point an urban salmon stream running there. And the river still flows even under, uh, underground. So we have to be extremely careful what we, you know, how we clean our cars, oil and all those uh, sediments, they, end up, they can end up in the river and that's very, very harmful for fish. And even in the winter salt, you know, we use salt for, to melt the ice and that happens very much when the time that the eggs are in the water, which is by far the most fragile time for fish. So we have to be very, very careful because whatever we, we live in, we end up uh, in a river, in a creek at some point. Yeah, exactly. So all, all, their, all of our drains <clears throat> to these streams. So yeah, whenever you notice those yellow um, fish painted alongside maybe a sewer drain, that's just a reminder, but all these drains are leading to the streams and the fish. And so just maybe think about what is going down your drain and all the drains in your homes and, and the different products that you're using um, and even different medication that people sometimes put into their toilets. Um, and so that's just something to be mindful because it does eventually enter into the streams and with the salmon. Okay, one last question. Um, do you know about the spike tooth salmon in the fossil record? Uh, no, but I'd love to. <laughs> I, I really like uh, to learn more about the, the history of uh, salmon as a fish. And uh, yeah, if you, if you, who made the question could uh, post something, I would love to. <laughs> but no, I don't, unfortunately. Yeah, there are lots of interesting things that are, people are discovering all the time. Um, right? Yeah. That's, there's a, a, a really cool thing. Uh, there's a species of salmon. It's very rare. It's a black salmon. So it's a small uh, kokanee. So it's like the, the kokanee is the salmon that lives in the lakes. And you have this small population. They're very small and they're black. So there's uh, one population in Japan and apparently two small populations here in, uh, in British Columbia. Mm. And... Uh, there was a scientist, Mike Pearson, uh, is a good colleague of mine, and uh, he actually found one in a ditch in Surrey, living very health, healthy, and you know, it's a black salmon, very small, totally different uh, from what you expect in a fish, living in a ditch. And uh, so, you know, salmon, it's very curious. I can uh, share later on that picture. And, um, you know, you never know what you're gonna find out about salmon, right? Yeah. <laughs> Such an amazing fish, so. Yeah. That's interesting. Black salmon. Oh, I've never heard of that. Yeah, I'll, I'll find that it, it's a very unique uh, animal. We found it once and gone. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, well, can you actually share your, um, your contact page one last time? For Just sure. So we can see uh, let me get the uh, Instagram. How to here. connect with the Urban Salmon Project or follow you on Instagram or social media. Um, and I'm sure yeah. if anyone else has questions you can uh, I'll post here um, so this is the Instagram mm -hmm. okay. can you and yeah. uh, this is the website of the project awesome okay. and um, oh yeah and also I uh, have a Facebook page as well okay. let me uh, find it here Oop. There we go. And the Facebook page. There we go. 
Okay, excellent. Yeah, so if anyone is interested, feel free to click on those links right there. Um, and I'm going to share with you just our brain coast. Oops, hold on. Yeah, I just it seems it's going just for the panelists. Maybe what I'm what I'm yeah. typing. Yeah, I think everybody can see that. If yep. uh, yeah, let me know, panelists, if you can all. Oh. Yeah, it just went to the panelists, I guess. Oh, panelists. Okay, hold on. I can share it. Um, all panelists and attendees. Oh, okay, there's. Hopefully, you can see that. That's the uh, Facebook link to Urban Salmon. I'm sure you can connect with uh, Fernando through that as well. If you want more information, so I'm just going to share our screen here one last time. And do okay. So yeah, thanks. Thanks again, Fernando, um, and thanks to all of our sponsors who are helping with educating people all over um, through this uh, series. And we are very, very fortunate to be able to still educate people during this time um, of all ages. So we're, we're very thankful. And if you want to learn more, again, this episode is going to be posted. Uh, the video is going to be uploaded onto our website. So raincoast.org slash coastal. And we'd love your feedback as well. So if you enjoyed this, um, if you have comments or questions or follow up, please feel free to email me at maureen at raincoast.org. Uh, and you can follow our work on Raincoast and what we're up to with all of our social media. So at Raincoast and at Raincoast Conservation. So thank you again, Fernando. That was a beautiful, beautiful visual journey. And I wanna thank everybody who joined us today. Um, we will be joined next week by our Renko scientist, Chris Daremont and Jess Housty from Bella Bella and the Health State First Nations. And so next week we are learning a little bit more about using different ways of knowledge and different understanding and perspective to understand the world around us. So through indigenous knowledge and Western science, um, how these two worlds can help us come uh, about with strategic conservation planning. And so I thank you again and right. see you next time. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye. Bye.